are getting up on YouTube here. All right, we are now live on YouTube. I'm just gonna give it one minute here while I take a sip and then we'll get started. Okay, cool. Actually, can I go grab a water as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, All right, go grab a water. One For those set. of you joining us here on YouTube Live, we're gonna get started here shortly. Um, you know, we got another conversation of entrepreneur struggle coming up for you. Steven Satterfield, who you just saw, run to go grab himself a, a water, uh, will be joining us to talk about all of his many ventures. Um, but as we always do with here on Entrepreneur Struggle, really talk through some of those challenges that he had to face and overcome and creating and scaling up all the different kinds of businesses that he's doing, which we'll you know, touch on here shortly. So give us a, a minute or two and then we'll get started. And if you are watching this live, you can also comment. Uh, I think I'm able to, this is kind of a new setup I have here, but I think I should be able to get your, uh, your comments, your questions in real time. And I'll you know, ask them with Steven you know, here as we're talking um, when, when the time permits. So we'll get started here in a minute or two, just bear with us and we'll get started with Entrepreneur Struggle. Just as promised, there is a man of the hour, Mr. Uh, Steven Satterfield, back in uh, in the seat. Got himself hydrated. Hydrated. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Critical. So yes, welcome back to Entrepreneur Struggle, where each week we're talking to different entrepreneurs and freelancers about their particular journeys, creating and scaling up their businesses, and really just focusing a lot on some of those know, self-care aspects and the mental and emotional uh, kind of things that we have to consider, especially as people leading businesses, leading brands. Um, and we want to this to be an experience where you can participate as well. So I do have my YouTube comments open. If you drop a comment or a question, uh, I'm able to ask it here of, of Stephen here in real time. So, um, you know, we might not be able to get to everybody, but we want this to be a communal conversation where you're able to take something away for your own personal journey. Um, and so, you know, Steven, thank you so much for being here. Um, we'll get into some of your credits here in a second, but first I just want to welcome you to Entrepreneur Struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you having me and just for, for keeping me and my work in mind. Oh, absolutely. You, um, you do a lot. Um, like even just trying to frame how I was going to introduce you was really tough. Like you're a sommelier, you're a writer, uh, a publisher, a multimedia producer. I feel like I'm a philanthropist. I figure I'm leaving off a lot of different things that you do, especially because I feel like you're always evolving. Um, so we'll definitely want to get into more of that. But I think a lot of people know you, especially lately, these last two years, through your work as the host of, of High on the Hog um, on Netflix, which if you haven't watched it, incredible uh, uh, piece of production, incredible you know storytelling that you are able to do within High on the Hog on Netflix. And I just want to let you know that one of the people on our network, Torre, um, literally forced everybody on this network to watch it. He's like, he got like an advanced copy. He's like, you have to watch High on the Hog. I don't care if you like food shows, this is the show, especially if you're black. So I just wanna commend you for the work that you did with that series. Thank you so much. It's just an honor to be in that work. It's an honor that that work was received in the way it was. Um, especially by Black people, by the Black diaspora, and um, the work continues. So I'm grateful. Yeah, and I mentioned that obviously a lot of people know you for High on the Hall, but you do so much more. And you, you know, are, you know, created Whetstone Magazine, which is, in, I'm sorry, Whetstone Magazine, which is in over 80 countries. Um, so we'll definitely want to talk more about that. But also now Whetstone Radio Collective, where you have over, I think it's about nine shows or so that you all have out now, um, mm -hmm. a lot of them podcasts. So we want to touch on that. But then also you've started the I Saw Foundation and uh, 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 was it Nopalize uh, that mm -hmm. you did uh, back in the day. Well, when you were in the archives, you're in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we do our research over here. <laughs> but like, you've done so many of these different things, but it seems like your journey really started in creating food. Like you were, you know, really trying to make food for individuals. And it seems like you went from making food to helping make people appreciate food in a new way. Can you kind of tell us a little bit of that journey that, that led you to, yes, go from creating to making people appreciate more of, of, of the stories of food? Yeah, thank you for that um, deep, respectful research. Um, yeah, so like you said, I had a notion that I wanted to be a chef at first. Um, I had two main influences 
from a food perspective. One was my own father, actually, who is a, a great uh, cook, um, uh, especially of the Black Southern American vernacular. Um, that That is a genre where um, I grew up not only on the cuisine, but really the idea of, um, you know, convening around food. My household was the one that would jump off for every holiday. Um, grew up in a Black Christian church uh, in which my, my father was cooking for the congregation. So it was around. And then um, <clears throat> as far as like on the, the sort of cultural, personal side, um, you know, this, this was in, I came up in, you know, the 90s um, at a time where the Food Network really um, became prominent. The idea of cooking professionally was, was sort of an emergent thing. Um, and I was really into it. So, you know, even as a high schooler, like I was watching cooking shows after school. Um, and yeah, I, I really kept that lodged in the back of my brain. Um, I tried to go to college for, um, actually I did go to college. Uh, I went to the University of Oregon um, in Eugene, which is so funny to to say because everyone's like, how did you end up out there? Yeah, from Atlanta and to Eugene. Exactly, exactly. And um, the truth is I had never been to Oregon. I had never even been to the West Coast. Um, but I have always had a sense of um, adventure and adventurous and curious spirit. And I really just wanted to go somewhere that was very far and different from, um, you know, the way I'd grown up in Atlanta. I love, I mean, not that I grew up in a way that I, I um, didn't have all different types of privileges, but I just wanted to see more. And so um, I decided to go to Oregon. Um, then I got hit with the the tuition, the out of state tuition after my first <laughs> semester. I said, we have some privileges. We didn't have, um, you know, I didn't grow up with, with financial privilege. Um, and so, you know, when it became real that, uh, I was gonna have to pay for my own education. It was a sobering moment for me. And um, I was like, I'm, I'm not, I, I was a bad student, you know, in high school, I, I never did well in school. And so I was like, I don't really see a path where I'm gonna go into this type of debt. You know? But I do wanna pursue, you know, culinary arts. I, I, I wanna see if I could be a chef. So um, I stayed in Oregon and uh, moved to Portland and went to culinary school there at Le Cordon Bleu. And um, I, for the first time, like really found myself, you know, like being a good student, um, being engaged in the material and so on. However, um, where I, the miscalculation was in uh, cooking as a, as a profession versus cooking for yourself and your loved ones. <laughs> And when you cook as a profession, it's it, uh, is more, at least in my opinion, akin to sort of factory work. It's quite compartmentalized. It's highly processed. You need to be, or, you know, I'm not the most organized person, et cetera. So um, it took a lot of the, the romance out of it for me um, in terms of wanting to be a chef, but my love of food was just, it was really on. Um, and so the rest of my life and career really became about how do I um, deepen my relationship with food in a way that feels true to who I am, you know? And so um, that has been quite a journey. Uh, it took me into a hospitality program. So I, I moved from basically switching majors, if you will, uh, from culinary to hospitality. That led me to um, an amazing teacher, very inspiring teacher who was a winemaker really taught, I didn't know anything about wine. You know, he really taught me about wine as an agricultural product. Um, I was thinking of it as a class product, you know, um, something about prestige um, and signaling. Um, but he really put me on to like, this is just agriculture. Um, and, and that was really profound. I fell in love with wine. It's still my greatest love in life. Um, 
And wow, yeah, the wine story. I mean, um, I became a sommelier at a very young age. Well, I was a teenager while this was happening. So, you know, what would have been like my sophomore, freshman, sophomore year, um, I started taking wine classes. And so um, I got really into it. Um, there's a movie called Psalm which um, a lot of people have have seen, but basically it's a commentary on sommelier culture, these very small uh, tasting groups with mostly white dudes uh, who are quizzing each other, doing blind tastings, you know, um, and people are like, is it really like that? Like, yeah, it's really like that. <laughs> um, and so maybe needless to say, or maybe not, um, I just got bored with that. I didn't really see myself in that um, lane. And so uh, I decided, especially as a Black, you know, this is before social media, so we didn't really have a way to see who was out there doing what. There wasn't many of us. And so um, I, I decided to go literally look for other Black people in, in the wine space, which led me to South Africa, um, working with uh, black owned wineries there at the time there was only two and that was uh, revelatory for me because I was like there's no black people who own wineries in South Africa um, that led me into a whole uh, dialogue around um, apartheid post-apartheid South Africa um, really politicized me I would say um, and, and meeting, you know, a lot of the indigenous and black folks on the continent, um, working in the wine industry, learning the, the echoing history of, of our history, my history as a black man from the U.S. South um, and, you know, their history um, colonized by, by Dutch and English people. Um, in ways that still continue to devastate and impact their families, you know, 20 five, 30 generations later. And so, um, so yeah, that was very deep for me. Um, I started to uh, tell stories on behalf of these uh, partners, friends in South Africa, um, making short films, writing newsletters, things like that. That was in like 07, 08, 09, around that time. And um, rocked this nonprofit for a few years. International Society of Africans in Wine, or ISAW. And um, we bumped up against a tricky thing with the 08 recession. So if people were grown or in the work space at that time. I don't have to say more. That was- yeah. that remember was a, that time. That was a moment. Um, and I'm so, yeah. the sweat right now, just thinking about it. Yeah, that was a moment. Um, so yeah, I, that then I moved to San Francisco. Uh, I went back, um, you know, shut that down and- 2010, moved to San Francisco, got back in the wine business as a sommelier out there, kind of hit a reset. Um, and then a couple years into that gig, uh, kind of remembered, revisited my calling, um, you know, and making content uh, uh, on agrarian based issues, um, land based issues, and started doing that on a, a local level in, in California, connecting with a lot of local farms there, making media about their world. Um, started doing that on behalf of the restaurant I was working for called Nopa. Um, as you alluded to earlier, uh, ended up starting this blog called Nopa Lies, um, which happened at the right time. You know, this was around the time Instagram was coming on. This was around the time Tumblr was a thing. Um, and so, you know, publish the, the barriers to, to digital publishing by the day, you know, started being removed. Um, and that was really the beginning for me. I, I did, I did that for a couple of years, basically turned that blog into a business inside of this restaurant group. And it got so big. They were like, you gotta, you gotta get out of here with that. <laughs> so we're, they, trying to, um, we're trying to run restaurants we're over here making a, a media empire. Literally though, that's literally what happened. Um, and yeah, basically um, that, that sent me into whetstone. I thought like, okay, how can I tell these types of stories about land and, and people and culture, but in a way that's global, you know, um, and that reflects the global majority um and not all this like farm to table stuff which is 
you know, has all of its other um, complications and trying to talk about when you talk about land and who has it and who doesn't and why. And so, um, yeah, I started Whetstone. I had the first concept for it um, really as a iteration of No Polis. Um, 2015, really, you know, started researching, thinking about it. it. Took me two years to get it actually produced and in the market. That was 2017. A couple of failed crowdfunding campaigns in there. Uh, very little enthusiasm for Whetstone being born into the world. So for other entrepreneurs out there, it was... Um, like it flopped as the kids would say now uh, that's hard it, that's hard to imagine just given where you are now by the way it's that's... it wasn't even that long ago that's the thing um but yeah i started a print magazine was able to really hustle that um and flip it into a directed consumer business and not just a, a magazine business um then flip that into podcasting and you know netflix came calling and here we are still rolling. We're on number nine now. We have nine shows out in the market, as you said, on our podcast network. We have um, uh, apparel, um, a textile project we're working on uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and uh, doing some Mezcal stuff down there too. Ex exactly. And then a huge um, announcement uh, coming next month too. Another big drop from Whetstone. That's amazing. Well. Yeah, congratulations on all that success, but also just overcoming some of those hurdles. Like you were mentioning, the crowdfunding was so difficult there with Whetstone. What, I guess, what eventually put you over the top there? Like you had a few failed campaigns. Was there something that you weren't doing in those early campaigns that you figured out later? Or was it just like people just didn't care yet and you just had to wait for the right moment? I call it the enthusiasm gap, a dissipation of enthusiasm. So basically, um, I did a Kickstarter in 2016 to start Whetstone Media. I was trying to raise 50 grand. And, you know, I did the thing people do, made a little video. Hi, I'm Steven. I have a dream. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I think so I, I ran. you like a make a wish video. <laughs> like, it was, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm glad I can laugh about it now. But it, it was it was dark at the time. Um, oh, no. But uh, but yeah, basically, you know, I made a video. I think we raised like twenty grand. But you know, the way Kickstarter works, I had to give all that money back. Um, and so then I came out uh, a few months later with uh, Indiegogo, another platform. And uh, I think I lowered my goal to like ten thousand, and then I think I got. Two thousand two hundred dollars from forty-seven people, and um, I was like, "Okay, uh, I don't have enough to start a media company, but um, I had a two thousand dollar clearance on my credit card, um, and basically took the twenty-two hundred plus the two Gs, bought." I think 200 magazines. It was like 20 bucks each, all in. Um, so it wasn't even really, I mean, I just broke even, but I shipped the product. And once I had the first volume out, it honestly came out better than I imagined. I was like, shit, this is kind of like what I had in mind, actually. <laughs> and um, it became a blueprint. And and once it was real and lit and tangible, this is why I love print so much. Um, I really saw, I saw a future. I saw a vision. I started, I, I literally would take magazines in a satchel on a city bike, go to retailers, you know, and say, hey, I'm, and back in those days, I would put my face in there. I don't do it anymore. But the reason I would do it is because I would go to them and say, look, I'm the dude in this magazine. Like, I want you to carry this product. And there's very few people who could say that. And so that like personal, emotional connection, especially when I'm coming in there like sweaty and pull a magazine out of a satchel with my face on it. They're like, all right, all right. Well, like, makes it hard you, to say no. Yeah. Like, you got to chill, man. Like, it's just like, <laughs> you know, that energy. Um so yeah, that that's really how how Whetstone started. It's just part defiance and um, 
you know, the conviction really came from just shipping the product and um, not necessarily from like the demand or, or consumer side. Got it. And I've noticed too, when, especially when you talk about Whetstone, you mentioned like really founding it on the principle of, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but uh, Tuar uh, mm -hmm. or Origin, like what, mm -hmm. what does that mean for you? Yeah, so um, Terroir is a French word and I actually, it's the same um, professor, John Eliasson, that came into my life as, as a teenager when I first learned about wine. Um, and one of the first things you learn as a sommelier is uh, basically how to assess the quality of a wine. And um, it's this information that is basically a language that allows people who can speak the language or who can at least create the illusion that they can speak the language can take something as mundane as grapes or grape juice and make it feel like a secret society. Hmm. And so that assessment is really about how to talk, how to speak this language. And it's about where does the wine come from? And all other conversations and assessments flow from that question around place. And, and so that for me, not only in that moment, but you know, until this moment has always been so illuminating because you're talking about an ecosystem, you're talking about uh, a number of different environmental factors that tell a story, right? And so I like to personify wine in that way because I really have that type of relationship. And so I started to see connections or ways to talk and think about um, terroir um, as human origin stories and thinking what happens when we put that same assessment criteria across other cultures and humans it's an incredible framework of discovery because those factors include in the wine context things like um what type of soil how many days of sun what is the uh elevation that the grapes are grown in? What is, um, how many meters above sea level? Um, what is the angle of the hillside slope, et cetera, et cetera, we could do this all day. And then of course you have um, the human input as well, right? Like who did the, who raised it? Who raised that wine? So for me, a, a simpler way to think about that, you know, I'm not, you know, not using a French term, it's just origins. And really thinking about origin as an organizing principle of understanding. And for food origin specifically, um, you realize it's it's work of decolonizing because so much of um, a reclamation of an origin story is a, is a revelation that a lot of what we take for granted is a lie, right? A lot of what we think has been entrenched is really some new shit, you know what I mean? And so origin is a way to actually from a, a identity standpoint, right? Is a way to take back power, uh, a narrative correction actually, that is deeply empowering. And that's really what my work is about, you know, fundamentally, um, because story is the most powerful and pervasive part of our human lives and experience. It's all we all go on every day, every interaction, all of our beliefs, things that make us emotional. So what type of stories we hold on to 
are ultimately what define our culture and our society. And so this is how um, I'm trying to have an impact in the world. Well, and you mentioned too, like the, the origin, the, the origin of this food is also the origin of the people who are making the food and, and who are cultivating it you know, with the soil. And you know, with Whetstone being in over 80 countries, well, Whetstone Magazine being in over 80 countries, and now with uh, Whetstone um, uh, Radio Collective, you know, you're telling stories all around the world there as well. You know, as you've traveled the world helping tell these stories and just learning yourself, have you noticed that this travel has allowed you to better understand who you are? And maybe not even just by going to Africa, but maybe some of these other cultures have exposed you to ways of life that maybe you didn't consider or just the viewpoints of the world. Of course, it's, uh, it's an incredible privilege. You know, when I talk about my privilege, I'm really talking about that Navy blue passport. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize like, everyone can't just move across borders, you know? Yep. So first and foremost, like I have a passport that works in most of the world. So that right there is very deep. Um, and secondly, for me, uh, this is why I have the relationship with wine that I do. Um, that is a language that I learned, you know? I can sort of speak Spanish. I know how to move in Mexico with all my Spanish, but the wine shit, I'm, I'm fluent, you know what I mean? Um, and so what that means is I've been able to go to other countries where I don't actually speak the language, like in remote parts of France, where it's like, we. I don't know any, I can't speak French, um, but I speak wine and they speak wine. And so when I'm in the cellar with them, when I'm um, tasting with them, you know, we have points of reference. They can, I'm asking questions about the soil, the, the vines, they're answering me in French. I'm asking questions in English, but we're having a conversation because we know we speak that language. And so it's allowed me to um, move in, in parts of the world in a way that I haven't been able to or wouldn't have otherwise been able to sort of access. Um, and I think that food is the best way and ought to be the preeminent way of trying to connect with a culture um, because it is the most essential part of not just any culture, but the human experience, because it's the only thing that we all actually have to do. We don't all have to be religious. We don't have to be a musical or, you know, any of the other things that sort of define culture, around class, education, everything. But food is the only thing that we all have. And so um, that if you want to understand a culture, then that's where you need to look. And also sounds like, yeah, some of those connectivities that we have, especially because, as you were mentioning, kind of at the top of this, we remix food a lot of times. So we can see how we've connected each other through the food that we have or that we've now developed off of what the, you know, those origins were of the food. Um, but you mentioned, too, just, yeah, having that privilege to travel. And I've been very privileged as well, maybe not as many places outside the country as you have, but I used to be on the road about 100, 150 days a year. And that's a privilege to be able to do that and see all these different places. But that also means that you're constantly on planes. You're constantly in a location that, you know, you are, may not be used to. I remember. Even Chris, that sounds hotel. stressful to me, man. <laughs> that's too much. That's too much travel. Oh, I was going to say, I woke up in a hotel one time. And I was like, hold on, where am I? Did I get kidnapped last night? I was like, oh no, that's right. I checked into this hotel last night. I just forgot. <laughs> but, that's like, the, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I mean, that's what happens when you're on the road that much. That's too stressful. It's too stressful. <laughs> but that's all I was going to ask you, because you have to travel a lot yourself. Like, how do you keep that balance for yourself moving around these different spaces? Like, you're doing it for altruistic reasons. But at the same time, you still have to take care of yourself. How do you manage both of them? Um, like many, you know, the pandemic was the uh, uh, turning point. That was the switch up for a lot of us who were really on the road like that. Um, 
that's the short answer. Uh, I really started to value um, being more restful um, in that time and value time for contemplation um, as part of a, a business strategy, actually, like really focusing. Um, and I know why I had to build the business on the road. And I mean, I just explained that, right? I was yep. hustling magazines out of the satchel. But at a certain point, and it was around this point, um, we had already filmed High on the Hog. We had already wrapped up this. Um, we had a deal with iHeartRadio at the time, a podcast deal that was wrapping up. Um, you know, the magazine thing was up and running. I was like, there's like, why am I really doing this actually? Am I on the road because it's it's what I've grown to know, right? Or is it really serving me? And um, I think I just reached a point where I was like, I don't think this is actually what's in service of the business. So that was very clarifying for me and very helpful. Um, but you know, for people who are at the stage of the journey where they do need to be on the road, I would say, um, things that really help, uh, stretching your lower back hmm. and core. When you get out of the car or the airplane, it sounds really simple, but, um, you have put your body in a precarious situation for, you know, many, many hours, you know, your circulation is off. Um, and then you go, let's say, have a meal or, or maybe miss a meal. Now your, your, your body chemistry is off. So I just find stretching and hydration um, to be very, very like helpful and practical things to do. Um, I travel with uh, a yoga mat and um, I'm always on my back, like putting my feet in the air um, or just like standing straight up, trying to touch my toes. Um, Cause I, when I was having back problems from traveling a lot, I realized that it was cause my, my core was weak and it wasn't like my core, like I need to do sit-ups. It was like, I just need more strength actually in my lower back and, and that strength and agility um, uh, actually came. I don't even, I don't even do yoga. I just bring a yoga mat and stretch out my back. Um, and it's helped me a lot. It's actually also improved just like my normal posture as well. So those are some practical tips. Oh, those are great. And I'd say, yeah, especially with that lower back too, like the hips, stretching your hips, like all that connected. Cause exactly. I, I agree. I, I definitely, the more I traveled, the more I started getting these little, little injuries, but most mm -hmm. of the time it started from my back and my hips. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. I, I, I'm not above pulling out a foam roller in the middle of an airport. I've definitely done that before. There you go. <laughs> foam roller, um, yeah. But with all the work that you're doing too, like you're managing multiple brands, do you feel that you constantly have to, and obviously you have great teams in place, but do you feel like you have to read every piece that comes out from your brand, listen to every podcast that comes out? Like, what is that oversight for you now at this point in your career and with your businesses? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, only because in the last two months is the only, this is the first time where I've really been confronted with that. Um, and it's just because of the, the volume of, of material that we're producing right now. Um, and so I think I'm just now beginning to engage with that tipping point. But for me, um, you know, the setup has been for me to not have that type of oversight. The editorial team that we have is the same team we've been working with for or, I mean, it's the team that built the company. So it's like, there's there's no new, I mean, the, we have, you know, there's more people involved in the process, but as far as like the editorial that goes out, it's the same people who built the company. So I have the most faith in the team. Um, and then, yeah, my job has changed a lot in the last year, especially we raised um, some pre-seed capital at right. that, 
thank you. It's a little something, but you know, we raised about a million and a half dollars um, to, you know, subsidize the podcast network. And so really just learning another language, right? Learning the language of, um, of investment, of venture capital, um, a language that I'm not fluent and I'll probably never be fluent in, but really, um, you know, having a vocabulary, right? Like you don't have to be fluent. Like I said, I can still move through, through Mexico. Um, and have been for years on, on, on my level of Spanish. Right. So you, as far as like language, just because you will never reach a stage of mastery doesn't mean you shouldn't engage with it. You know, there's still so much access. It's about access, access to information, opportunities, et cetera. And, and, um, mostly access is blocked by an inability to decipher the language of that sector. And so um, I spent so much time last year learning, you know, that vocabulary. Um, and as I learned that, you know, I, I really started to see my role shifted into like a CEO, you know, like I really have to be the visionary leader for this business. I need to hire other people to manage and grow the vision. I need to grow the business. Um, I need to not run out of money. I need to be compliant. I need to have a, a board of directors. You feel me? So these are things that are way different than um, me on a satchel. Also, not only was I the guy on the satchel, I, I edited every single photo that we did for like the first three years. You and we're there, everything. everything. I mean, the article, that's why I'm like... <laughs> I, the, the brand is better than it's ever been because I I'm doing the least on the editorial <laughs> side like the reason y'all are loving it is because I'm not touching it really so um so yeah that's what I mean about honestly just the blueprint and um I think the the folks who have been growing the business over the last few years took the blueprint to a place that um again exceeded even my own imagination well, especially because, yeah, you've been the face. You literally were the face on the magazine that you're mm -hmm. trying to go out and sell them early on. Mm -hmm. Now you're in a position with the podcast network that you have with, uh, sorry, with the uh, Whetstone Radio Collective. Mm -hmm. You have all these shows that are hosted by other individuals. Obviously, you host uh, Whetstone Audio Dispatch, but you also, you know, I noticed on the first episode that you put out, you kind of have somebody else leading that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. everything you've done has been super collaborative. But now, especially in this podcasting space where you're having people to basically be your brand ambassadors on all these different shows, was that tough to get to that point to allow people to speak on your company's behalf that literally used to have your face on it? Not really for me, actually. I don't, I don't know what that means but i the way my like come up is very improbable in many ways you know i came i was a sommelier just a few years ago as i just told you and doing a blog for a farm to table restaurant like not that long ago and um the reason i wanted to start whetstone is because i was very uninspired by what the what was being published in food media i was like this is very um myopic and so i think i could actually like do this better and um and i think i really did have some degree of humility i mean i was a little naive like but it, it wasn't like um i wasn't just like trying to talk shit, but that i was perceived as an agitator you know, um, because I was publicly um, in San Francisco, you know, I'd be on like little panels and just kind of making a case for a need for a kind of media. It seems so obvious now, but the world was, I mean, different not that long ago. Um, that was more inclusive and, um, you know, that it was really harmful to, to not have Black people featured in food media, for instance. And um, like how that erasure really uh, reflected the same kind of erasure that was happening in our physical space as well. And so post 2020, all of this sounds like, obviously, what's where's the rub? But we're, this was 2000, 
14, 15, 16, um, 17. So I was on like a lot of panels and, you know, just like a black person who was agitating in food media. Um, and until I had something that was actually in the market that I could say, I'm not just an agitator, but actually I made something that's better, <laughs> right? Like I lead this marketplace. Exactly. So I'm not just talking shit on the sidelines. I actually made something to prove my point. And that's really when um, I had an opportunity as our, as my opportunities grew um, to run our business, how I, how I wanted it, what I was agitating for when it seemed impossible. And that was, um, if you actually let folks from various cultural backgrounds tell their story, um, that's going to be way better than anything I could do as a journalist, as a writer, flying by for a long weekend, being like, and then functioning like an interpreter. But again, you don't even speak that language. You just got there five seconds ago. But that's how people were doing media. That's how we were learning about other, it's just, it still baffles me. And so for me, the idea was always like, let's get people who really are of these cultures who have the cultural context to talk and teach us about this food so we can have the, the best experience. And that has really been um, uh, sorry, someone just texted me. We were nominated for a Peabody Award. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. That's really wild yeah that is a I, just to be complete as a career goal of mine so kudos to you right there on the peabody nomination man that is huge um yeah i literally just found out thank you i'm kind of stunned um yeah so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, let me let you have that soak in for a second uh because you you definitely uh you should enjoy that 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 moment right there so let that ruminate for a second, um, because I think that that is a nice culmination of what you've been working on and speaks to the authenticity of what you were doing. And just like you were just saying, not just flying in somewhere and trying to tell someone else's story, but empowering those who are part of that community to tell their own story. Right. That's what, you know, that's what gets you those kind of accolades now, you know, and that's a beautiful thing that we've gotten to that point now. But to your point, it's only in recent past that we've kind of gotten there. Um, and so that intentionality of how you've been operating in this space is probably why you're nominated for such a prestigious award. So again, well, congratulations. Thank you. I'm not actually like, I don't, I'm not like, you know, was, I'm just more kind of um, stunned. I mean, I just shared my story with you. So like, it just, it just seems um, laughable, honestly, like, uh, because, there just didn't seem to be a large marketplace for these ideas. Um, has media shifted in such a way where um, the, the machine of media, which is really about the power of distribution, scale and distribution, um, it's still just, it's still owned by the same people, right? We do have um, now a marketplace for the ideas, but the business, you know, um, and you know this, right? Because you are a Black person who owns a media business. Yep. And so when you really look at it, you're like, have things changed? <laughs> things are changing, sure. But... Um, you really need to to do the go to the origins, because what's happening is that, yeah, it might look more diverse. The bylines might look more diverse, but the the ownership structure. We have work to do. 
So that's really what I'm focused on, you know, as well as like just being viable, minding my business, growing the business. Um, And the other stuff is honestly for the team. Like I know the, I, as the face, you know, you get so much credit for making stuff happen. Um, and High on the Hog is so not just about me. It's so much about so many other people. Um, many of those folks who really do celebrate, you know, this, these types of um, <laughs> okay. accolades. <laughs> so yeah, I, and I, and I feel that though, you know, I'm happy because the, the energy of the message was like, yes. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's great. I'm happy for us. Now you're amplifying that message. Yeah, totally, totally. So, so um, amplifying, like you in general, like you have been amplified in so many different ways. And obviously the Peabody nomination will amplify you even more. But I was just talking to a friend of mine recently who's been on a similar kind of come up in the last few years. And we were joking about how like now there's these, these like celebrity pages of like, who are they dating? And like, how tall are they? How, and like, so much of the information is false. Like they made the person five inches taller than they actually are. And they're, you know, said yeah. that they're married, but they're not actually married. Like how yeah. do you handle this invasion of privacy that you're now probably experiencing? Um, I have experienced it. Uh, <laughs> and I actually am 6'4", so if you see me in the streets, <laughs> I'm probably taller than you. Um, honestly, it's really hard for me. You know, I, uh, I'm not someone who loves being a public person um just to be real and um you know i think that um as someone who's very comfortable being the face of something comfortable um being a purveyor or even a spokesperson for ideas um there is some tension some contradiction um in that versus like let me share my life with you which is um very much now baked into the uh experience of online media right just being online um and so you know i think the way that i'm handling it is just like i'm just ebbing and flowing with it at different intervals i'll need to have different a different kind of relationship with it um but I don't foresee a relationship with it in a way that I'm kind of uh, broadcasting myself, you know what I mean? Um, which I hope goes without saying, like, no, like, please get it how you can get it and do what's natural for you. I mean, that's what I've been talking about from the jump, like, just trying to move in a way that I feel called to move. You should move like that too. And for me, I don't personally want to share all that with everyone. Um, And so it has made me more um, reluctant to want to share actually personal stuff. Um, And it is a price to pay for all of the other incredible things that have happened, but it's it's a small price um, if I'm being real. So I just rock with it, but it's not my preference. Well, no, I think you always keep the focus on the work itself. And uh, I think you've been doing an excellent job at that. And I know we only have a, a few more minutes here, sure. um, but I did want to make sure I asked this question because it was it was bothering me as I watched a lot of your content. Like there's got to be sometimes you're recording and like, you know, always say such nice things about the food but there has to be some times you're like man this is nasty like what, what are you doing in those situations <laughs> or has that yeah. even happened like have you just been so blessed you've only had amazing food every time no i've had some <laughs> terrible food and i'm not gonna tell you <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna tell you um i'm just gonna tell you that yeah occupational hazard man but i have had plenty of bad food Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna make you out anybody. You got we got a you have an amazing career that we don't want to derail at any point here. So um yeah. I, I really want to thank you for being part of this this conversation. Um thank and also you. just thank you for the work that you're doing. I think you know, telling those stories, that connectivity between food and culture and our history, 
I think is super important, but especially as a black man, what you did with High on the Hog and all this other work that you're doing, but especially with High on the Hog, it really helped to make that connection between Africa and, and America and also just that connectivity um, between us now, not just our history, but where we are still connected, especially through that food. And even as you're talking on wine, just creating more of that equity um, for individuals and taking your platform and now making it a platform for others, it's just extremely commendable. So I really appreciate, appreciate everything you. that you're doing. Um, but Thank also, you. I want to make sure to give you some time to let people know where to find you and what you're doing. So if you can you know, mention some of those social media platforms and also just any other places where people can stay up to date with everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you can find me online at I saw Stephen, uh, and Stephen is S T E P H E N. And actually, now y'all know the origin story of the acronym I saw for um, the old wine nonprofit. Um, and then, yeah, I'm I saw Stephen basically everywhere on social. Uh, we are Whetstone Magazine on Instagram. That's Whetstone with the H and Whetstone underscore mag on Twitter, which is a very active platform for us. And um, stay tuned. We have a bunch more stuff uh, coming out for the social channels. If you are a podcast listener, um, you can just put Whetstone into the search bar and there will be a whole cornucopia of shows and programming um, to choose from from all over the world um, so yeah check us out whetstonemagazine.com we have hundreds of articles from all over the world on our website as well wonderful and yeah if you're listening to this on the podcast or whether you're watching you know this on youtube we're gonna make sure if you go in our description those show notes will have those listed out for you all those um, different sites that uh, Stephen just mentioned make sure you support and stay up to date and then we're going to watch you as we uh hopefully see not only a peabody nomination we want to see that nomination become a a win i know you don't care about the win itself but i care about it they want to so. see that y'all want to see it <laughs> and i want i want it for all of us there you go appreciate yes. you thank appreciate you so much you. chris thank you have a great rest of the day and for everybody listening thank you for for being part of this conversation uh, you can stay up to date with me and what we're doing with Entrepreneur Struggle by following us at, at DCP Official on all social media platforms. If you're following us on TikTok, it's at DCP underscore pods. Um, and you can stay up to date when we're having these conversations. Um, but again, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for listening. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy because that struggle is real. Super. I'll see you all. Nice. And now you get to see in real time how I learned how to end a live stream. All right. Uh, all right, so I think I just ended it on YouTube and then... Um...